Good evening and uh, welcome to Behind the Headlines. Today is Wednesday the 25th of November 2020 and in tonight's programme we'll be asking is Brexit still relevant in the new COVID world? And we also got a sad announcement to make on this channel that um, Felicity Corbyn Wheeler uh, has sadly passed away today at the age of 80. She presented uh, Get Well, Stay Well, was very much loved by uh, so many of our viewers. So our hearts and prayers go out to a family, but uh, we know that Felicity is in, in a much better place uh, in heaven. So thank you, Felicity, for all the work that you've done on, on Revelation TV. I she passed away yesterday, apparently, so um, it's a sad day for, for all of us at Revelation TV. Um, it's uh, great to be uh, joining you, uh, my co-host, uh, Reagan King, on, on tonight's programme. And, um, you know, for, for once we're actually discussing something that really should be dominating our news headlines, but it's not. And that is the issue of Brexit, knowing that we've only got five weeks to the end of the transition period in which we either leave the European Union with a deal or we leave with a no deal. And how all this fits into the new global dynamics that we're seeing, such as the likelihood of a democratic presidency in the States, um, though it's going to be closer to, to Europe. The fact is that we haven't got any allies anymore, uh, maybe Australia and a few other former Commonwealth nations. But essentially, the big question is, is Brexit still relevant? Well, I never thought that I would say, after all the programs last year and stuff, politics today and all, all of that, that um, I would be looking forward to talking about Brexit again. I mean, it, here we are, um, 2020, we're four years after the referendum and we're still talking about Brexit. We're um, a year past when we officially left the EU, but uh, we are, of course, still in that transition period until, as you say, five weeks from now. The uh, end of December, we reach the end of that, and then everything is going to be changing. Um, you know, businesses have to take a lot into consideration. I was reading an article in the paper today uh, giving some particularly vague advice on what businesses, particularly small business owners, can be thinking through and looking forward um, to. So for them, it's very relevant. Uh, for EU nationals who are living in um, the UK, it's very relevant. They'll be needing to uh, apply um, if they've been here only a certain period of time for um, people wanting to import and export, completely new rules. There's going to be different tariffs. Uh, all of that is going to have a real impact and potentially even on uh, our, our own daily lives, whether we're involved in that sort of realm of a business or, or not. Um, there are going to be some significant changes. We may see some economic changes. We may very well see um, some changes in terms of how we travel. It's all quite vague. I mean, one would think five weeks from now, uh, by this point, we would have an idea of what life is going to look like post-Brexit. But there's... We haven't a clue, do we? There's still absolutely nothing that's been finalised. Uh, and also, you know, what, what, it's because of COVID-19 that... The issue of Brexit has really been <laughs> almost pushed back to, uh, completely pushed back in terms of the news agenda. Um, and you probably find Brexit seven, eight pages into a national newspaper rather than actually dominating our news headlines. But because we've only got five weeks, um, this is crucial. But there are some key developments that have taken place in terms of, of Brexit, of why we should be troubled and why we should be alarmed at what type of deal this government could possibly get with the European Union. Um, the first thing is that President Trump, um, and uh, he was a huge supporter and still is a supporter of Brexit. Mm -hmm. He opposed the European Union. So we had a natural ally in the United States. Why uh, Theresa May and Boris Johnson failed to get a, tr a trade deal um, during his time in office during the past four years, is, is a question that I can't possibly answer, apart from absolute stupidity and naivety on their part. Uh, we also have the internal dynamics now um, that uh, Boris Johnson has changed his entire uh, administration in terms of who's working at number 10, mm -hmm. uh, with Dominic Cummings gone, uh, gone and Lee Kane as well, his um, he, communications director, who were both strong Brexiteers. Uh, puts Brexit in doubt. Uh, we've also have the fact that 
with the possibility of Biden coming in and becoming president, who is the only the second uh, American Catholic ever to take the presidency mm. with strong Irish roots. Um, the whole idea of the uh, Northern Ireland backstop and a potential border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland is a huge sticking point for him. Um, and that will threaten Britain's relationship with the United States. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, if we haven't got enough on our plate already, it, it's looking very messy. Yeah, and if you consider that uh, Joe Biden has also already picked um, for Secretary of State man Anthony Blinken, who um, is very, very critical of Brexit. Um, he described what's been going on and our decision made as a total mess. Um, so this is what we're looking at. We're looking at uh, relationships going south, continuing to go south with the EU. Nothing was done in the past uh, four years with the US um, to secure that trade deal. And we're going into a, a situation where on one hand we have the EU that's still feeling a bit burnt and unhappy with us. But at the same time, the US is very much increasingly pro-EU and the Secretary of State has gone on record as describing this whole process, which I can see if we're talking about the process itself, it has been a total mess. Um, that there should have been choices made, there should have been deals already reached um, with, with the US particularly and um, other countries as well. But as you said, COVID has created, I think, a, a massive excuse, and that's what it is. It's presented a massive excuse um, to avoid making some very important, crucial decisions. And I think there may be some regret um, going into the new year. Absolutely. So just to remind that we are live, we are interactive tonight, so we'd love to know your views and your opinions. Is Brexit still relevant in the COVID-19 world? That's our question for you tonight. Um, what concerns me, I think, also um, so much is you mentioned, for example, um, the proposed US Secretary of State. Mm. Now, his name is Anthony... Lincoln. Lincoln. He served as the, uh, get my notes here, he serves as the Deputy National Security Advisor in Obama's in a, in administration. He's known to be very hostile towards Brexit um, and compared it to a total mess and even compared Brexit to the far-right Marie Le Pen's rise in France. Uh, he described the UK's handling of Brexit as the dog that caught the car then the car goes into reverse and runs over the dog. And he says it's a total mess. He also said that our interest would also be in keeping Britain in and to leave the UK, uh, sorry, to leave the UK, the EU, as chaotic and self-destructive and is not a preferred choice for the US. And so the, the potential new Secretary of State under, under Biden uh, would be a disaster in terms of British... US relations, uh, and he's put his stall out very, very strongly in terms of what he thinks of Brexit. I asked you earlier, Simon, why it is you think that we've gone four years and still haven't reached this point where there's anything concrete? We're only five weeks away. And you responded and said um, that it's really down to globalism. Um, flesh that out a little bit for viewers and... Uh, well, 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 firstly, you know, let, let's go back. We have to go back in time a little bit. Let's go back to uh, 2016 and those, uh, that incredible month when, against all odds, mm. the British people voted to leave... Well, the majority of British people voted to leave the European Union uh, back in May of 2016. Over 17 million people won it by over about 1.5 million votes. So that's a huge margin in terms of a referendum where each individual had the right to vote. The whole apparatus of government was behind the Remain campaign. So the fact that the Brexit and the Leave campaign were able to match that was an incredible feat. So that then resulted in David Cameron uh, resigning as Prime Minister. And of course, then Theresa May was allowed to become leader of the Conservative Party and also our Prime Minister without really being challenged in, in any kind of leadership, any decent leadership contest. And of course, she, she was famously called um, Submarine May 
because any discussion on Brexit or the referendum, uh, and they wanted her to speak, she'd just disappear. Uh, and of course, then she found herself as prime minister, and the whole concept was that she supported Remain in the European Union. And I think she came to power and was a very, very weak prime minister. But she had an interior agenda. She kept going to the EU and said, I need, a, I need an agreement to say that we've got Brexit. Um, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to say to the British people? Uh, and we were constantly humiliated um, by the European Union in those negotiations. She came up with a Brexit withdrawal agreement that effectively meant that we, are, we had Brexit in all but name and that we would be so closely aligned to the European Union that we'd be effectively still in the European Union yeah. um, rather than out of it. So, and that's also because you know, she's serving different interests. Uh, she wasn't serving the interests of the country like previous prime ministers. I mean, we've even had um, Gordon Brown, our former prime minister, call for world government this summer with the COVID-19 crisis. Yeah. So we know that it's very rare to have a prime minister or a head of state that's willing to buck this globalist trend, um, particularly with Joe Biden, possibly now in the White House, that's looking bleak. I think also that uh, the, big, the big trouble concern for me, uh, I'm not a great fan of Dominic Cummings, um, mm. who was the, uh, he was the director of the campaign, uh, Leave campaign, uh, back in the referendum, became uh, head of uh, Boris Johnson's chief of staff. It looked like he, he, he was indispensable. Uh, in terms of his strategic uh, awareness, his intelligence. Um, he won, essentially, Boris a huge landslide of over 80 seats in the last general election in 2019. Um, and with him gone, um, I tried to think what kind of deal we'd end up getting with the EU, because there's nowhere for Britain to turn anymore. This whole concept that, that what Brexit and what um, President Trump represented was a move away from globalist institutions, a return to national sovereignty and self-determination, and, and governing in the interests of our people rather than governing in the interests of an, of a, an elite. I have a couple of emails here, and then I want to come back a little bit to that. Um, so this is from Glinda. Let's hope that President Trump has another four years. The vote is being taken to the courts. Prime for Trump is he is the best for the USA. God bless Glinda. And, and unfortunately, Glenda, while you're right, it, um, he is continuing to take this to the courts. Uh, Simon, I, I don't think it's going to happen. And uh, everything is very, very clearly pointing. Even Trump has essentially conceded uh, that Biden will be the next US president. By allowing a transition, here's a transition team to have access to intelligence yes. information and being able to work behind the scenes, he's allowed that transition team to, Already. to take place. And, and I think it's important as well for, um, for, for ourselves and for viewers to, at this point, um, recognize, okay, we, we, if we're flying in an airplane, um, we, we may not like the pilot in some ways, but we desire that the pilot succeed and we, we pray that he um, does well. So um, we, we should remember to pray for, um, for Joe Biden and the Biden presidency uh, that God would bring them to repentance where repentance is needed and that um, there will be a, a shift in some of those policies. I've been dismayed to read of and to see clear plans uh, for some extremely detrimental policies um, across the board, and we're talking about some of it this evening. Um, and yet, we know that nothing is impossible with God, and He, he can change the hearts of man. So, um, thank you for that, Glenda. Uh, we have from Hugh. He says, "I don't think Biden is any more Catholic than the present Pope. Maybe it's just me being suspicious." But um, were the EU stalling until uh, the so-called Great Reset? And we, we talked about this Great Reset. A little while back, what, what are your thoughts on, on that? Do you think there's some stalling in decision making to, to just lead into this? I mean, uh, well, 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 one thing, yeah. one thing's going to be sh uh, sure is that because COVID nineteen is global and the economic fallout of co global nineteen, uh, sorry, COVID nineteen is absolutely massive. It, it it's a good opportunity uh, for these globalists uh, working for the World Economic Forum to reset the world economy, to bring the world into closer harmony. And that means in loss of individual freedoms in terms of 
expanding kind of world government. We know that, uh, for example, uh, the Trump administration are very keen on that. Uh, sorry, the um, Democrats under Joe Biden are very keen on that. I just got to reiterate that uh, Trump was uh, totally opposed to that. And also we have the likes of the change of influence within 10 Downing Street. Uh, Carrie Simmons, the fiance of Boris Johnson, um, has effectively taken over so much control of uh, 10 Downing Street. And she has, a, what would you say, kind of liberal uh, leftist views within the Conservative Party and is passionate about green issues. And of course, the whole economic reset or the global reset is all about uh, promoting climate change to change policies. Uh, and that's what we're going to see in 2021. We have uh, this from Anita, Evening Simon and Reagan. Sad to hear about Felicity. Love and prayers being sent to her family at this sad time. I hope Rachel and Randall are doing well, Reagan. They are, thank you. Uh, love and prayers being sent to you all. Uh, Brexit has been such a decisive issue. Mom, Dad and I voted to leave the EU and my brother and sister-in-law voted to remain. It has definitely split the nation. I just hope we can get away from Europe with or without a deal. The Irish border is going to be problematic, to say the least. I'm just praying to God to find a way through. Whilst I have nothing against anyone in the EU, I still feel that we need our own sovereignty. The laws were far too intrusive, and I had an uneasy feeling uh, that Germany would end up ruling the roost. Um, so, you know, there is this reality we were discussing a, a few moments ago of globalism, and one of the big problems with um, with globalism and is, is coming back to a little bit of what you were saying there, Anita, uh, you, you have this consolidation of power um, to a very few um, elite powers around the world uh, that call the shots, basically, and, and many of them are in some ways steered by various corporations and various economic and financial interests. Um, one of the problems with pushing Brexit forward has been um, this fact that there's a, a globalist agenda that's undeniable by um, the powers that be and politicians um, that have been in their place. Um, one of the real concerns with the Biden um, presidency um, that's likely upcoming is going to be that they will be very, very much pro-EU, very much pro-globalist uh, agenda. Um, some viewers may be thinking, okay, well, wh what's wrong exactly with globalism? It sounds like a good idea, and we, we were talking a bit earlier, Simon, it, on paper, you think, wow, okay, yeah, this looks great. It's some sort of utopian plan where we're all interconnected and everything's great. Think back to where we see that in the Bible. In Genesis 11, we read the story of the Tower of Babel, and um, we, we see that that immediately follows um, this uh, portrayal of one who was described as a mighty hunter before the Lord or against the Lord, Nimrod. Nimrod was uh, a messianic-like character for the whole of humanity at that point who were, despite God's call to go and fill the earth and multiply and, and spread throughout it, um, remained together in the same place. They all had the same language. They all were... Um, were, were walking together and then they arrived at this one place, beautiful place in um, this valley. They build this city. Um, Nimrod is their leader. They say, we're going to build a tower, which was a symbol of their rebellion really against God and of their elevation of humanity. Globalism is an elevation um, essentially of um, a sort of humanism. It, it, it yeah. exalts um, mankind exalts our endeavors. It secularizes. It removes um, Judeo-Christian values and, and beliefs from the public sphere, and um, it, it, it takes economic principles um, that are fundamentally um, detrimental to responsibility and healthy society, creating big government, a nanny-like state that uh, is involved in every element of your lives and, and my life to, to the point that um, there's, there's a total loss of, of freedoms. So um, I, I think your concerns there, Anita, uh, re regarding, um, you, you mentioned particularly Germany, I've heard that expressed, even friends of mine in Germany uh, have said, we were so happy to hear 
uh, that you have left the EU. If we had the choice, we would want to, but we're pretty much the main ones keeping it together. But it all depends on if we get a deal with the EU. There we go. Uh, and, yeah. and particularly now that uh, Dominic Cummings is uh, no longer involved, there's a great concern that we would have very much a watered down uh, agreement uh, with the European Union that effectively means that we're still very much tied into the European Union. Uh, only this week, uh, the uh, EU's chief negotiator, Michel Barnier, has effectively said that he will not go to London and resume uh, talks on Brexit unless we give way on our fishing rights, as the uh, French are demanding parity and access to, to our fishes, which is vital, I think, in the uh, post-Brexit world. So, I mean, that's, that's another issue uh, of extreme importance as well, is will, will Boris actually cave in? We know that he's not a great man of detail. We know that, as a, as a character as well, he likes to be popular doesn't actually like to actually sack anyone um, or actually take authority and doesn't want to be seen to be disliked. But his whole premier hangs in the balance when it comes to Brexit because that's what the British people voted him on and that's what will be judged on. So if he ends up giving us a bad deal, um, then the electoral consequences for him, I think, are horrific. Yeah, um, I mean... We voted very clearly four years ago uh, in majority by over a million to leave the EU. David Cameron had promised, he said, regardless of the result, I'm going to be with us and steer us through the process. He, he jumped ship. Theresa May comes on board, um, as you, you indicated, and just we, we see Brexit in name only um, was being proposed. Boris talked a very good game which uh, I believe Cummings and uh, Lee Kane, uh, others who were part of that Leave campaign were really spearheading it. Um, it enabled Boris to uh, have a very commanding performance in the last general election at the end of 2019. COVID-19 has not done Boris any favors. He's faced immense criticism for his handling of the situation. Uh, from all parties, uh, there's been double speak, there's been constant U-turns, uh, there's been extreme concern over freedoms being stripped away. I mean, I was just on the train earlier and saw this um, a horrifying blurb about an elderly lady being hauled into a police van outside um, Parliament because she was protesting on her own, not causing any rabble, um, a, a, an MP. Um, was there to witness it and challenged the police on this and has called for the Prime Minister to, to come up. All of these things have, have caused Boris Johnson to um, become less of the darling that he was for many at the end of last year. Personally, I believe if he cannot see either a very good deal reached or uh, a conclusive and decisive, we're happy to go forward on these terms without a deal, uh, I think we may be in for a leadership contest in the new year. Possibly, but wh where, where can Brexit go now? Uh, and this is the big question for this programme, because what it did is mm -hmm. it did represent a kind of a spiritual renewal in, this, in our nation. It represented an opportunity to pull back uh, from a Babylonian spirit, which is, uh, which is the European Union, that um, spirit of, uh, of Babel, as it were, um, this humanistic idea that uh, they could achieve their own way to heaven, essentially, um, and by doing that, of actually dividing up the nations of Europe with all their history, with all their traditions, and become a kind of unifying force and unite all these nations under one leadership. And the concern is that the British people, the European people, never got a chance as we've gone further into European integration, further down the line of a European superstate. Mm -hmm. So here was a chance in 2016 to say, let's put the brakes on this and let the British people decide whether we want to go ahead in this European integration. And this is a big mistake, I think, those who voted for Remain failed to see, is that the European Union never stands still. Um, where it is now is not where it's going to be in five years' time, because it's always moving closer and closer to its end goal, and that is the United States of Europe. 
Now, do we want to be a part of the United States of Europe or do we want to be an independent sovereign nation where we govern ourselves with our own own laws and our own regulations? That's the question. Also fits in with what's God's plans and purposes mm. for this nation. And history has shown that we are an island for a reason. Um, that God used our nation powerfully throughout the last couple of hundred years. A, to stop Napoleon. And if we look at the French Revolution of, of 1789, it was very much the same spirit of Antichrist that we see in the world today. Whether it, the same spirit that mm. represents the European Union, the same spirit that represents the Democrats in the States, mm -hmm. uh, this whole concept of being anti-God, putting man at the center, was at the heart of the French Revolution. So we saw that God uh, raised up our nation to prevent uh, Europe being united under Napoleon. And it was a, a battle for which language would be the most dominant language in the world, whether that was French or whether that was English. And of course, English won. We won at the Battle of Waterloo in uh, 1815. And as a direct consequence of that, England, English was the most superior language of the world, which meant that the gospel could be spread to the four corners of the earth. And there was a concept of the gospel, there was a concept of, of law, of, of nationhood, and that God is the ultimate authority in the affairs of mankind. Going 100 years later, we've got the First World War and German imperialism wanting to take over Europe with their invasion of uh, Belgium and France. That resulted in Britain being used as a nation to prevent the spread of uh, German imperialism. And then we saw then in the Second World War that God used this nation and we stood alone against the Nazi threat in uh, 1940. And again, with uh, American help, uh, we managed to push back Soviet expansionism um, during the Cold War. So there's no doubt that God has used this nation powerfully. And it was our hope that he would somehow use this nation again in these last days to prevent the rise of the Antichrist. But what seems to be happening now is that it's full on acceleration into those uh, globalist plans. And the book of Revelation is uh, becoming a lot nearer. Yeah, it's uh, evident even from some of the messages that are coming in that uh, people recognize and see God's hand in and, and that, that opportunity for some change that came as a result of that referendum. Uh, personally, I was thrilled in 2016 when um, the result came out because it did represent a recognition of national sovereignty, uh, the ability to take back um, our laws and to um, make sure that our laws were um, in consistence with those laws that um, are, are best for mankind, God's laws. Uh, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a, a reproach to any people. Now, that is the hope that one can have. That is the prayer that um, many of us offered and continue to offer. That is um, a desire that, that we should have as we seek the good of not only the city we're in, the, the, the country um, that we're in. We desire the good of our society. At the same time, we recognize that while the opportunity was there and while there was a step towards that opportunity, uh, we have not embraced that opportunity. Rather, uh, many have, those, those in power um, particularly, have continued to embrace this um, idea of, well, let's try and hold as tightly as possible to, um, to what we were so that there's not much differentiation after the fact. So we've talked about Brexit in name only, um, where national sovereignty is a fairly cheap term. It doesn't mean that much, where um, our laws are still in large part dictated and governed by um, the EU, where um, we are still beholden to trade deals and, and terms um, based on um, the EU, where essentially we're subservient. Yeah. Um, and, and, and this is a, a big part of the problem. We can see consistently in um, the past um, the, the past 20 years, but I think in a very much a fast-tracked way since um, 2012, 2013, um, a, a real um, cultural zeitgeist that is anti-Christian, fundamentally against um, God's word, fundamentally against um, I anything that seems friendly um, towards the, the God of the Bible. Um, you know, 
we, we can talk about the benefits of multiculturalism and we, we can say, okay, you know, it, it's wonderful. Personally, one of my favorite things about living in London is that you have people from everywhere, but that's not really multiculturalism. That's having people from everywhere around the globe in the same place. Multiculturalism is this ideology that's really part of, of globalism where um, you, you basically have to acknowledge that um, all cultures are equally, um, e equally right and equally good. Uh, that means equally righteous. That entails not just cultures. It's not about ethnicity. It's, a, it's about practices. It's about beliefs. It's about behaviors. That's why we have this constant tension as well um, in, in many places where um, our, our government and its laws clashes with um, Sharia law and other things like that where you know, the, the, the tension between um, cultures that are fundamentally anti-Christian meeting um, a, a culture that in its law still has a kind of Christian makeup that though vastly eroding, um, it, it's, it's getting to a point where it's very difficult to see uh, much of a positive way forward. By God's grace, our hope is ultimately not in the here and now. It's not in the fact that we are citizens of um, this great country. It's not in the fact um, that, that we um, have Brexit. Our hope, our citizenship is in heaven. And to that we look while seeking the good of uh, the place we have and while seeking to be good citizens. Absolutely. Uh, and um, it's also very much linked because at the same time we, we saw in November of 2016 that against all odds President Trump beat Hillary Clinton and uh, also then gave some hope um, in the world that uh, we could get a very good trade deal with the United States that um, the two nations that God has really used over the last 100 years would come to the fore of uh, international politics once again uh, to lead the world as it uh, we have done during the first and also the second world war and also in the cold war um, and there was a great hope but uh, but now that hope seems to be dashing but but it also puts into perspective very much like you say that our citizenship is in heaven you know we are we're sojourners we, we don't belong here but however we do want to see um, our nations governed on biblical principles. We do want to see our uh, concept of freedom of religion and freedom of speeches. We do want our churches open. You know, we, we do want to see a sense of morality uh, in our society. We don't want to see this secular militant humanism um, that is dominating the ideology and the thinking of the West because we know that ultimately that will destroy our nations. Um, and it will sow the seeds of our own destruction. Uh, because, you know, w without, without God being at the centre, nothing lasts, nothing, there is no foundation. So whatever foundation that we see now it is not going to work. So we have this from Peter. Could you please tell me where the Bible says we should prevent the rise of the Antichrist, as this seems to be what many Christians are focused on now, more than the proclamation of the gospel. Where does the Bible say we should do this, please? Um, Peter, I, I think perhaps you've misunderstood um, something that's been said. Um, our, our fundamental responsibility is not to prevent the inevitable uh, rise of the Antichrist. Our responsibility is to preach the gospel. We are to, um, at the same time, have our eyes open and our ears open to be discerning as to what's going on around us. We are to actively, I mean, we're not supposed to say, oh yeah, okay, here, here it is, open open up. Uh, we, we have open borders to the, the Antichrist. We want everything to be um, in, in favor of this anti-Christian agenda. Proclaiming the gospel in and of itself is an act of resistance to the Antichrist. It does not stop his inevitable rise. Um, and ultimately, we take great joy in heart and have much peace in knowing the Antichrist's days are numbered. Um, wh whoever he is revealed to be, he He's already lost. This is not his kingdom. This is not his world. He will establish what he thinks is his kingdom. He'll make this what he thinks is his world for a time. He's lost already. So um, just want to assure you, we're, we're not saying that we can stop the inevitable, but yet we should. Yeah, but I think, I mean, also, I think we have to yeah. get a bit more of a kind of theological perspective uh, and a grip on this. Um, 
when you read the book of Revelation and when you read all the kind of prophetic scriptures relating to the last days and the rise of the man of lawlessness, as he's called, um, we get to an understanding that this is going to be the worst period of human history. It's, it's going to make the Second World War and the Holocaust look like a walk in the park. Um, and it's going to be the greatest catastrophe ever to fall on mankind. And the sad thing is, we're not that far away. So the important thing is to create awareness of where we are in terms of end time scriptures and end time events in the hope that we p tell people the need to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, ask for forgiveness of sins and walk with him because time is running out before these dramatic events take over the world. And it will be horrific uh, for that seven year period until Yeshua HaMashiach returns uh, with his church, with his bride, to rule and reign for a thousand years. But it's going to be an absolutely horrific seven years. And, and many Christians don't focus on that. They focus on the fact that Jesus is coming back, but not knowing what would actually happen. I mean, during the tribulation period, if you want to become a believer in Yeshua HaMashiach, it'll probably mean that you would end up uh, sacrificing your life. It would be a blood sacrifice in order to come into the kingdom because we know that those who refuse to worship the beast, who refuse to accept the mark of the beast, uh, will be beheaded, be beheaded, which is described in uh, Revelation chapter 13. And we have here in the past, God wanted the people to move to the other area of the planet, probably becoming different people groups, but they decide to all stay in one place and build the Tower of Babel in disobedience to God. Uh, result pride wanting to be their own God. Um, but God confused their language showing that he is God. And today many nations and peoples are wanting to be their own God. And that is dangerous for them um, because by doing so they are not acknowledging the God of the Bible but leaving the door open for the God of this world, Satan. I think a, a large part of the spirit of this world is the sense that we are the captains of our fate and the masters of our souls and we're, we're just plunging headlong into these actions that are presented to us as, as for the best of humanity, but that we know um, from, from God's word are incredibly detrimental. Uh, we, we have another, uh, so quite a, quite a few emails coming in regarding the election. Uh, you know, there's equivocation, there's some disagreement as to whether or not Trump has conceded. Has he, has he not? Will Biden be the next president? Biden will almost certainly be the next president. Unless there's an absolute miracle. Uh, yeah, and, uh, unless, and I mean, his, his team's already feeling, uh, Rudolph Giuliani's already come out and said, mm. I've overstated um, the level of support that we, he said, I think it was one state, I can't remember what state he said, I think it might be in Arizona, where he effectively said that we actually thought there were more uh, ballots uh, than there were, uh, the, sorry, there were more number of, he said that there were more number of votes than there were uh, actually people living in that state, which turned out to be incorrect. So mm. when you have his top lawyer kind of contradicting yeah. himself and others and stuff as well, I just think now that, that it would just be impossible for him yeah, it, um, it, to actually take over the presidency, even if they came out and presented all the evidence, got all the evidence, it's going to take months, if not years, to sort all this out. Um, by that time, it would have been too late. And, uh, you know, there's... And the world now has accepted that Biden mm. will be president, uh, and that's who they want to deal with. Yeah, and this idea that only the liberal media and BBC and, and whatnot have called it, that's also less and less accurate. Uh, most people, even conservative commentators, are saying, no, it, it, it's time, there has to be a transition. This is how democracy works, whether we like it or not. It's true that the Democrats have spent, um, you know, a, a large part of the past four years um, challenging the results of the last election. The Republicans have that right to do that as well. Personally, I don't see the profit in doing that, I think there needs to be a, a sense uh, in, in which um, people get their heads together as to how to come back in four years in a much more productive and helpful manner. Uh, but that idea keeps coming up a lot. Uh, David Cameron left because he passed the bill, um, uh, bill and law concerning marriage, other issues. Um, he stepped down because EU wanted that 
but Jehovah didn't. Teresa May left because she had a chance to accept Christ as a personal savior, but she said no, she lost his favor. Boris is doing what's best for this nation, no one else can. We must uh, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and um, Jehovah's was God's. We need to go back to the roots and stuff. Um, I, I understand a little bit of that. I understand a little bit of what, what you're saying there. I would say that we have to know that uh, Boris, whether he's doing what's best for this nation or not, I think is up for debate, but um, no one else can. Well, clearly God raises new leaders all the time. And at some point or another, Boris is going to see an end to his tenure. And who knows? I mean, what, what, what do you think, Simon? Do you think that we're going to see some resolution to all of this uh, what, Brexit what stuff all, before, all, Boris? all depends on what kind of deal yeah. we get. Uh, and this is the scary thing. And this is, this is why, as Christians, we really need to be praying. If we care about Brexit and we care about our nation, then we really need to be praying about this situation because we only have five weeks left either to get a deal with the European Union or to come out with a no deal. Um, both are problematic, but, but essentially the reason why this is so important is because if we get a deal with the European Union and we don't look at the blueprint and we realise that this is a bad deal, then this, this will go badly for, for Boris Johnson uh, because he's put his whole premiership on the line regarding Brexit. He was strong on Brexit when he came in. Um, uh, there's no doubt that his... Um, Having COVID as well has had a, a, probably a big impact on him. Um, and now we see that Dominic Cummings is gone. Uh, we see that uh, his fiance Carrie Simmons, is effectively running the show uh, and pushing through this, uh, uh, this, what I can only be described as kind of green agenda that they have now. Mm. Uh, that the government's announcing and pushing through to deal with, uh, to tackle climate change, which will effectively destroy our economies it will effectively mean that they will use this to gain more control over our lives in terms of freedom of travel free and access with jobs. It, it has huge implications. And he hasn't really, really focused on talking about Brexit. He said he's going to get involved in this week, and he really needs to because his, his premiership's on the line. Some years ago, it was suggested that uh, Samantha Cameron, David Cameron's wife, uh, was very much a part of um, decision making in uh, his tenure as prime minister and that a lot of that eventually backfired. Um, Boris is in a situation here where you said his fiance seems to be steering quite a lot. Boris has throughout this year appeared afraid to confront. He despite modeling himself previously as a, a sort of Churchill, has, um, it's fair to say, not taken decisive, definitive action um, in, in cases where uh, there's been that need. Uh, there's been constant shifting and changing, constant U-turns. Arguably, the country is uh, now coming from a very good e economic state where um, people's livelihoods were increasing and thriving. Um, it, it's tanked out, it's tanking out. Um, we're seeing increasing numbers of people reliant on the state. And so this is, in one way, COVID-19 has been a perfect distraction for the government to do whatever it wants to do regarding Brexit without any lobbying, without any real pressure. Or any um, kind of media insight either. Accountability. I, I, think, yeah. I think that's the other one. But also we have to look out for Allegra Staten, mm. who's been appointed as Boris Johnson's head of communications. Uh, she was a journalist with the BBC and The Guardian. Uh, and previously she is um, showing her conservative credentials by previously voting for the Labour Party, Green Party and the Liberal Democrats, but is close friends friends with Rishi Sunak, the, uh, the Chancellor. Um, so it just goes to show that I think we're having a, a liberal influence over, over our Prime Minister and uh, it, it's these two powerful women that are effectively guiding and directing Boris Johnson's decisions, uh, which I think we're concerned about because they're not coming from traditional conservative uh, positions, as it were. So also when you look at a Prime Minister, you have to look at the people that he surrounds himself with and his advisors, mm. who his advisors are, who's giving him advice. Um, and I'm very concerned at the moment, particularly in the light of Dominic Cummings not being around, 
that uh, we could be heading in the wrong direction, certainly as far as Brexit is concerned. But where does Brexit go? We've got a few minutes left of the programme. With uh, Joe Biden uh, as, as president, there is nowhere that Brexit can go. Um, and that's the danger. Well, there's also the threat uh, that the talks scheduled for this week are going to be called off unless Boris caves in on fishing rights. Uh, the French are holding out for near parity access to our fishing waters. So, you know, we, we, <laughs> rock in a hard place here. We, we have the US on one side with a very unfriendly um, new, new uh, pr presidential makeup. And then we have um, the EU. But ultimately, um, we have to entrust it to God. And that's Absolutely. what I want the viewers to do, to um, take some time r right now to, uh, as we begin to close out the program, to take this to God and ask that he would overrule. We're uh, commanded to, to pray for our authorities, for uh, those that God has placed over us in these particular um, positions. Pray that uh, the talks in the next five weeks would um, produce that which is good and upbuilding um, for our society. Um, that God would have his hand in these talks. Ultimately, um, you, you were sharing uh, a scripture earlier. Absolutely. So let's, uh, let's leave the program on scripture because it's edifying. Absolutely. Uh, and this is taken from um, Philippines chapter 4. Uh, be anxious for nothing. No, it's, it's quite fine. I'm just trying to find it now. Sorry, just bear my chapter notes. Chapter 3, verse 20. Yeah, that's right. Verse yeah. 20. Sorry about that. Just find it. I'm on the wrong page. That's why. Here we go. Okay, so I can't find that moment. Let me just read it from here. It said, our citizenship is uh, in heaven from which we wait for the Saviour, the, uh, the Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able to, to subdue all things to himself. <coughs> so I think the central message from tonight's programme is let's look up, realise that our citizenship is not on this earth, but is actually in heaven. And uh, that is where our hearts should lie, and uh, with him. And that when we're with him and we're abiding with him, he can give us the peace amidst the storms. Absolutely. Hebrews 11 tells us of those great um, people of faith, not great because of any merit of their own, but because they knew God's mercy. And um, he, 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 we read in that passage that uh, particularly Abraham and the others who followed him, they were looking for a city whose designer and builder is God. They were looking forward to a homeland um, that is not fashioned by or ruled by the hands of men. We have corruption here, um, but there's righteousness in that new heaven and new earth uh, that awaits us. We know that there's much evil headed our way. We, we know that um, the scriptures are clear, in the latter days, difficult times will come. And yet we entrust ourselves to our great and almighty God, the ruler of heaven and earth, who has promised that he is coming again. The martyrs will be vindicated. Um, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, resurrected and alive, is going to return in power and all who believe in him will have that hope of everlasting life. Amen. So I just want to thank you for watching uh, Behind the Headlines tonight. Uh, you know, we can see dramatic world events uh, shaping and changing our world, but we don't need to be shaken because we have faith in Yeshua HaMashiach. And he's the one who will give us peace through these dark and troubled times. And let's just remember that we are not citizens of this earth. We are not British citizens, but we are heavenly citizens. And that is an important perspective to get in these troubled times. So thank you so much for watching Behind the Headlines.
Show me. 